Hello, I'm Sam Ingalls. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Sound on Sound magazine and welcome to everything you wanted to know about headphones in the studio but were afraid to ask. If you're new to music recording, you might be thinking, one pair of headphones is pretty much like any other, isn't it? You've got a little speaker for this ear, a little speaker for that ear, band that goes over the top, cable that trips you over. Not much more to know. Well, it's not quite that simple. And in fact, you can even get headphones with just one speaker for music recording. So in this video, I'm going to try to answer some of the most commonly asked questions about headphones in the studio, what the different types are, what they're useful for, and what you need to think about when choosing them. Wired or wireless? So you might be thinking, I know, I'll get wireless headphones, then I can use them in the studio and in the bath. Uh, it doesn't really work like that, unfortunately. Wireless headphones sound weird, especially if they've got active noise cancelling, they have batteries in that run out, and worst of all, they introduce latency, which is a delay between your computer making the sound and it coming out of the headphones. And also, let's face it, if you're in the middle of a busy recording session, the one thing you really don't want to be dependent on is Bluetooth. I've known drummers that were more reliable. So for music recording and music mixing, you really are going to need old school analog headphones with a cable coming out of them. But which ones? Open or closed? The bit of a headphone that actually makes the sound is a diaphragm or membrane that moves backwards and forwards. And when it does that, it doesn't just push sound out in the direction of your ear. It also pushes just as much sound out in the opposite direction away from your ear. So what happens to all that sound? Well, the idea behind open-backed headphones is we're just going to set it all free, let it float out into the room. And the problem with that, of course, is that if there's anyone else in the room, they can hear what's coming out of my headphones too. And if there's any open mics in the room, they will pick up what's coming out of my headphones. But what happens if we try and contain that sound instead? If we don't let it out into the room, what happens is that it bounces around inside the ear cup and eventually it's going to come back to our ear alongside the wanted sound and it's going to colour that sound. And for that reason people say if you want the best possible sound quality for mixing you need to get open backed headphones. But again it's not quite as simple as that. It is true that most bad sounding headphones are closed back headphones but really that's actually another way of saying that most cheap headphones are closed back headphones. It's a bit like saying that convertible cars are better than hatchbacks because they never made a convertible mini metro. Actually, maybe they did. That's a bit of a frightening thought. Which headphones are the flattest? What do we mean when we say we want our headphones to have the best possible sound quality? I think most of us would take that to mean we want them to have a neutral or flat frequency response. So you might expect to look at the specs and see graphs of frequency response like you get with microphones, and that way you could then just pick the ones with the straightest line. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, and one reason for that is that there's actually no standard for measuring headphone frequency response. The frequency response of a pair of headphones doesn't make any sense to measure without someone's head in the way, and everyone's head is slightly different. The frequency response also changes with things like the amount of wear on the ear cups, how they're positioned on the head, how terrible your haircut is, and that sort of thing. So you can't tell how flat any given pair of headphones are going to be just by looking at the specs. What you can do is investigate headphone correction software. There are a bunch of companies like Sonarworks, Desonic, Tone Boosters that specialise in measuring headphones and they'll supply an EQ curve that corrects them and makes them flat according to their idea of what flat is. That works pretty well in my experience. And also, even if your headphones aren't completely flat, you can actually get accustomed to minor variations in the frequency response. One thing to remember is that with headphones you don't get any of the problems associated with room acoustics. So even if your headphones aren't perfectly flat, they may well actually be more flat than monitor speakers in an untreated room. Can you mix on headphones? Why do we want a flat frequency response from our headphones? It's so that we can make the most reliable decisions possible on those headphones. And the time we need to make the most reliable decisions most of all is when we're mixing. 
As we've seen, if you've got really good headphones or corrected headphones, they can easily be flatter than loudspeakers in a room. So you might think, well, they'll be even better for mixing on. Not necessarily. For me personally, when I screw up a mix on headphones, which obviously I never do, it's not the frequency response that goes wrong. What happens is I'll put that mix up on loudspeakers later and I'll suddenly notice that the kick drum is far too loud or the vocal level's all over the place or I can hear the banjo. And the problem with mixing on headphones is that you can't hear the bigger picture. It gives you an unnatural focus on detail. Headphones let you hear the trees that don't let you hear the wood. Can you hear a wood? So, yes, you can do quite a lot of stages of mixing on headphones, and maybe you can even do a complete mix on headphones, but for me personally, would I ever give a mix to a client without at least checking it on loudspeakers first? No. Which headphones are good for tracking? For recording, you'd think that what you want from headphones is a pretty good degree of isolation, and under some circumstances that's definitely true. If the artist is recording to a click track and you don't want click track on the finished record, you're going to need to give them closed back headphones that don't leak sound. Even then, artists are amazingly good at getting click bleed onto the microphone. What they'll do is they'll take one earpiece off, they won't tell you and you won't notice until it's too late. For that reason, when I'm in the control room, I'll try and keep the click muted in here. That way, if I hear any click at all, I'll know it's a problem because it's coming out of the headphones and into the microphone. Then I can hard pan the click so that they're only getting it in the ear they've actually got on. Or I can even give them one of those special pairs of headphones with just the one ear cup we talked about earlier. But it is worth thinking about why artists might want to take one earpiece off. And when they do, it's because they're not really comfortable with the isolation that they're getting from the sound in the room. They need to hear what's coming over the headphones, but they also want to hear the sound that they're actually making in its natural form. For that reason, I do actually think there can be a place for open-backed headphones in recording. Because open-backed headphones don't just leak sound outwards, they also leak sound inwards. A good example of where that can work is when you're recording a live band in a room. If you put the guide vocal on open-backed headphones, it's not going to cause a spill problem because it's in the same room as a drum kit and a guitar amp and other really loud things. But it will allow the band to hear themselves much more naturally. Even when you're overdubbing to a backing track, there may well be a case for using open-backed headphones if it gets a better performance out of the artist. A little bit of bleed from the backing track onto the mic might not be such a big problem, might be a price worth paying. One other factor that you need to consider when buying headphones for tracking is reliability. They're probably going to be abused. They're going to get thrown around. They're going to get used very heavily. You don't want to have to throw away a perfectly good pair of headphones just because a drummer's sweated on them or because the cable has snapped. So any good studio headphones will have lots of field replaceable parts. They'll have removable cables, removable ear pads, and all of those things will be available as spares that you can buy to keep your investment going. High or low impedance. If you're using headphones in the studio, one of the key things they need to be able to do is play loud. That's partly because we're often listening to stuff that's much quieter than finished, mastered music. It's partly because they need to be able to keep up with a loud drummer or guitarist in the live room. And it's partly because it's fun. So how do you know whether any given pair of headphones will play loud? Well, you look at the specifications. And two specs are key here. One is the efficiency of a pair of headphones and the other one is their impedance. In general, what you're looking for is high efficiency and low impedance, or at any rate below 100 ohms or so. So you might be wondering, why does anyone actually make high impedance headphones? What possible use is there for a pair of headphones with a 300 or 600 ohm impedance? And the answer to that is that those are made to cater for very specific circumstances. If you need to give out a large number of headphones, you probably don't want to have a separate headphone amp for each pair of headphones. Instead, what you do is you connect them in groups to a smaller number of headphone amps. And when you connect headphones in parallel, 
the overall impedance that the headphone amp sees falls according to the number of headphones connected. So it'll actually see a similar sort of impedance as one pair of low impedance headphones. For normal studio use though in a small studio, stick to high efficiency, low impedance, and you'll be fine. How many pairs of headphones do I need? You might have started watching this video thinking you were only going to need to buy one pair of headphones. If so, I'm sorry, because you've probably realized by now that that may well not be true. In particular, if you ever record a band, you're almost certainly going to need enough headphones for every member of the band to have one. So given that you haven't got an infinite amount of money, what's the best way to use that money when you're buying headphones? Well, I think there's a good argument for spending quite a high proportion of your budget on a single pair of good open-backed headphones. They'll be useful for mixing and for editing, and surprisingly often, you can also give them to artists during recording. Then you can spend what's left over getting a collection of cheaper closed-back models that will be useful during band recording. But of course, there are many different ways to slice up this particular pie, and it will depend on your own individual circumstances and budget. So thank you for watching. I hope this video has been useful and that it's answered some of your questions about headphones in the studio. If you want to know more, the new issue of Sound on Sound is out now, and it's got a bit of a headphone focus. In particular, our cover feature sees star engineers explaining to us how they get good results mixing on headphones. We've also got all the usual reviews, features and workshops, and it's out now. You can read it for free at soundonsound.com. As for me, it only remains for me to answer the most fundamental headphone question of all. Straight or curly? Curly. Curly, surely. Straight. Curly. Straight. Straight. Curly. Straight. Curly. Curly. Definitely curly. Straight. Thus, I don't get both. <laughs>